Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all for a second time in the service. I love this, love this, and we'll we'll uh, do it over four weeks. This series on Jude. It's a very powerful series. It's a very uh, short, punchy series. Uh, a book that is short but very weighty. It's it's the uh, thing that would. Uh, Give, you know, it's like giving a, a good kick in the guts to false teaching. Uh, you know, it, it's not going to hold back, it's taking false teaching down. That's, that's the sort of impression that I want us to have. It's, it's contending for the faith, it's a fight. It's not, it's not just a half-hearted thing. Jude, and we don't really know who Jude is, is speaking to a people who we're not sure at a time that we don't really know. Okay, so you get what's important here? The message. The message is important. Jude, most likely a half-brother of Jesus. Probably, tentatively, between 67 and 70 AD. But we're not sure. So you get the idea that this, this, this is really, this is the Jude that starts off by saying, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith after he said, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share. So he's eager to write about the salvation, but no, I, I see a problem here that I need to address really quickly. So this is Jude who didn't always believe in, in, in who Jesus was. But here he's going, it's not just about the salvation. We need to make sure that what you know matters. That is the contend for the faith that was entrusted, that was delivered. It's a present of Jesus and he's given it to us. And if we think that the teaching of the word of God, if we think that all we've been given by Jesus, if we think that all that we believe in, if we think the faith that we have is not precious, then we're crazy. You may as well not be on about the Lord Jesus. If you don't think that the word of God has value, if you don't think that all he has given us has value, throw it all away. And so when false teachers come in and we want to treat them lightly, Jude is saying, ah, 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 no, 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 no. This is something that you've been entrusted with. This is something that is precious. This is something that you do need to protect. And the, word that, the words that you hear, which is probably the most common for, the, for people talking about any sermon series that I've ever heard, Contend for the faith. That's the words that I've seen so over so many times repeated. Contend for, contend for the faith. They're the words that Jude uses. That word contend is, is, is a Greek word and it's, you know, it's this long and it's got consonants in all the wrong spots. So I'm not going to try it, but the middle word is agony and trying to say it is. But that agony, that contend. Is, is an agonising, it's, it's a wrestling match, it's a, it's a strenuously going to the point of pain. It's really fighting hard for the gospel. It's fighting hard for the faith, for what you believe. It's fighting hard to say, and, and, and if you have a look at um, Paul, now Paul, you know, I mean he wrote a few books, didn't he? But when Paul's reputation was on the line, when he was challenged, he said, but what does it matter? The important thing that is in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this I rejoice in Philippians 1. But when Christ's reputation was on the line, uh, such as in Galatians 2.11, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. And then in Titus, we remember, silence them. Silence them, rebuke them sharply. You know, silence them like gag them, chuck the socks in the mouth. I still am picturing the socks in the mouth. Is anyone else? You're like, you've got to stop them. It's nothing light. If Christ's reputation is on the line, if who he is for people is on the line, if how people are going to receive that gift or not receive that gift is on the line, if they're going to receive it in the wrong way, if that is on the line, you think not receiving the gift is a bad thing? Absolutely. You think receiving it in the wrong way is wrong, is bad? It, absolutely. And that's what Judy's saying. We want the gift to be there. We want it to be present. Uh, a present. 
We want it to be. We want it to be real. We want it to be alive for people, and we want it to be true. It is the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no way around it. So believers here, he's saying, get in, love the word, and defend the faith. Now, not quite defend the faith in the way that we think it, as um, uh, Spurgeon said. The truth is like a lion. Who ever heard of defending a lion? Just turn it loose and it will defend itself. This is the way the word of God is. If we begin to proclaim it, it will defend itself. But when it says fight for the faith, make sure that what is said is true. Make sure that what goes on in the body of believers is not misrepresented. Make sure what you hear in the pulpit, what you hear in the worship time, what you hear in prayer time, what you hear, that people will go, that's what the truth is because that's what the body of believers are saying. Make sure that it is true. Make sure that it is right. Make sure that it is pure. Make sure it is accurate to what God is saying. I mean, you can... For certain individuals, you know, certain individuals, these people, it goes on, these people, you can see Jude. You know when someone says, those people, it's not a nice way of saying it, but you're saying They've crept in, they've snuck up, they're, they've come in. And, and the Lord Jesus told us they were coming. The, uh, Paul has given warning. They're here, they're creeping in, they're misrepresenting the gospel. Though you already know this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt. These are the, actually before I, I better go on. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago, written about long ago, have slipped, secretly slipped in among you. These are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only, our only sovereign and Lord. They pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Do you know the significance of that? It's, it's so crushing. So crushing. We talked in, in Titus about that there are those who false teach by adding law and saying it's about law and you know, you need Jesus plus this. You need Jesus plus Mary. You need Jesus plus works. You need Jesus plus 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 we want to make think this is how you need to live and this is how you do it and this is it gotta you gotta gotta not comes you know what we do in good works comes out of our faith in the lord jesus comes out of our love in the lord jesus the lord jesus compels us it is him present in us who comes out in good works nothing of ourselves and that's the purity there but here we have licentiousness so legalism or licentiousness and, and, and where, where the grace of God will cover everything. You know, it doesn't matter what you do, whatever. You know, it's, it's the relative society that we're in, you know, relativistic society that we're in. That you just, yeah, whatever, whatever makes you happy, you know, whatever's good for you is good for you, whatever's good for me is good for me, and, and we'll be okay. And so you can just do, do whatever you want, and in the church we can do it, but it doesn't matter because we've got grace. Do we keep on seeing that grace may increase? By no means. Do we think that grace will cover the sin so we can just keep going on doing whatever? By no means. Yes, there is an absolute. There is a God who is declared. And that gift was given once for all. It was a once for all that we don't add anything on. We don't add anything like in the Mormons who have added and added and added. It was done. Here we have the good book. We don't add on. We don't go, oh, this is what we want. This is what we don't want. We don't change, we don't live our lives in a way that just says, that doesn't mean a thing. Do you see, even the life reflecting our belief needs to be consistent with the word. Our life, our belief need to be consistent with the word. 
We see false teachers denying the death and resurrection, denying the return of Christ, denying the deity of Christ, adding to, taking from scripture, even by diluting its content, <coughs> blunting its impact. We need to take caution in shaping scripture by overlaying, and this is where I get concerned, is that we overlay with our understanding and appreciation of culture. And we think that we can easily think that well, how does culture, how does this, how does the word relate today? And sometimes I think we reshape it to fit the culture rather than the culture being understood in context of scripture. And we need to be very careful. We may as well be, uh, we'd be as guilty if we change this, we'll be as guilty as any cult. We need to take care in what we do. The faith was given us. God gave the word through the apostles. The gospel, however, lies with God because the apostles are just like us. Yes, they have been given authority, but they need to rely on the Lord Jesus. We need to recognise the importance of the word. And it is a privilege. Do you know it's a privilege that you've been given the word? Do you know it's a privilege that you've been given the faith? And with that comes responsibility. And it's interesting here because Jude doesn't tell us, Jude here isn't telling us to believe the faith, spread the faith, or live the faith. Although those are appropriate, his one here is bang, 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 contend for the faith. Fight for the faith. Wrestle for the faith. Faith. Wrestle in a way where you give your all and you'll do everything to see it done. It's like an athlete preparing for a, for a race or for a fight. They're not going to go in half-hearted. And this is what we see in the examples that we have in 5 to down to, uh, even down to 10, 5 to 10. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. We've just done the Exodus series. We, we see a, a generation who, who saw the, 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 the plagues of Egypt, we, who saw the Red Sea, who saw deliverance. And there were some who yet did not believe. Because you see, they had the 12 go out and there was Caleb and Joshua and the crew and 10 of them came back and said, though, look, getting to the promised land. We'll go and have a look what it's like. Oh no, it's fortified, it's got giants there. It's, it's crazy, you're not going in there. You're, we're not going into the promised land. You've got to be crazy, you've got to be nuts to going in there. And they came back and they said, we just don't believe that can be done. And Caleb and Joshua said, no, we believe that it can be done. And there was judgment. So if you turn to um, Numbers 14, verse 20, and the, and the section in here is Numbers 13 and 14. The Lord replied, I have forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. No one who has treated with me with contempt will ever see it, because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly. I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. Do we pick up on that? Believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believing in God. Believing that he is the powerful one. Believing that he has loved us. Believing in the promises that even though the promise for them did not seem to be able to be done, God had it for them. And that's what we need to believe. Sometimes life is tough. But when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, he promised us he will take us through and we will have eternal life with him. Wonderful eternal life that is. Anyone else excited? Amen. Woohoo!
Absolutely I'm excited. Absolutely you're excited. We can't wait. Do you see? That's what encourages our belief is, is fighting for the faith, seeing the promises and saying, yes, they are true and they will happen and it's not, not going to happen. Then in verse 6, And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the day. The angels. If we go to Genesis 6 there at the beginning there, we see that the, uh, the, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. There's this immorality that the angels are showing. There's this pride. And I think there's that sense of pride that can make us all fall. And it's interesting that even angels fall. And false teachers be aware. These angels faced judgment. You will face judgment. You know, these angels were not happy with the role God had given, not happy with the life that God had given. You know, it reminds us of us, doesn't it? Not happy with false teachers who are not happy. They just want to live how they want to live. They want to live ungodly lives, and yet we'll cover it by grace. It's all about me. It's about what I want. It's about what I, I think I need. <coughs> but they are reserved for judgment by God. So false teachers, you won't get away with it. You may think, oh, it's all nice and rosy. God is delaying his judgment, as he is with the angels. And in verse 7, in a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual, sexual immorality and perversion. They serve it as, as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal life. Sodom and Gomorrah was a, a well watered, uh, like the garden of the Lord. And, and you know what? They weren't even grateful. They weren't even grateful for the wonderful place. They, they became arrogant and, and uh, overfed and, and, and unconcerned, a bit like what we see in Titus. You know, the, the Sodom and Gomorrah, the, 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 the liars, the evil brutes, the the lazy gluttons. This is sort of what Sodom and Gomorrah was like. And you can see the false teaching in Titus coming out with the false teaching in Jude that there is a, a, a deep concern when you have people who are living, living like they just want to be able to live uh, the way that they want to and not think there is an impact. There is a pride to say, this is, what I, this is the way I want to live and I'll be okay doing it. Thank you very much. But then it gradually degrades and degrades and degrades to detestable matters, so much so that then in Sodom and Gomorrah you have you, you, if indicated with, with Lot this desire for homosexuality, uh, gang rape. It's, it's, it, it's just the, the absolute extreme where, we're absolute, where there's an absolute depravity, there's an absolute uh, horror about the, the way that Sodom and Gomorrah was living, the way that those other towns were living. This is, can you imagine as a false teacher being compared with Sodom and Gomorrah? Can you imagine being compared? But they're living un ungodly lives. And I know that, that we, if we continue to go on sin, we're not really considering Christ. Now, I am not saying that we don't have trouble. We're not free from sin in this world. We're not free from the present, you know. We need to keep on going back to God, saying, sorry, repent, turn around. I realise that what I've done is wrong. I realise that's rebellion against you. I realise that... Um, see, I, the one thing I think about sin is, is that we don't quite grasp what it's like. But if we have a party full of five-year-olds and we go in there with loaded weapons, the disrespect that we show God is taking is worse than that. Is worse than taking a loaded weapon into a group of five-year-olds. It is. It is. It is going to before the Lord with sin. That is how horrendous it is. Is absolutely horrific. 
And when, it's, when Jude is talking about false teachers here, there is a wake up church. Wake up people. The truth in people's lives is at stake. And Sodom and Gomorrah, a good example of facing judgment. <coughs> they serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. If you're looking at eternal fire, don't look for Jude about a theology of hell. Let's, let's just... It's, it's not, it is, but it's, it's not something to get caught up here because that's the, the essence of what <coughs> Jude is saying here is judgment. That's what I want to have in our heads. It's that false teaching, judgment. Because if you try and compare Sodom and Gomorrah, anyway, come and have a chat with me later. The one thing, eternal fire. Don't want to be facing it, false teachers. Do you see this condemnation? Do you see this? That's absolutely the worst, false teachers. Jude is giving you every example he can to say the worst that you could know is the worst, that what you, is the worst thing you were doing. by leading people astray. Let's just pray. As we go on, Lord, I pray that, that we would take this seriously, that we would not be overwhelmed. We would be empowered. Lord, I pray that, that what comes out of this is a real awareness of how important you are and how important your word is and how important life is with you. Help us not to get caught up on the little things. Help us not to get distracted by the little arguments and discussions and that, that could be detrimental in its own way. But help us to stick to the truth, the life in you. You are the way, the truth and the life. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. In, the very, in, the, in from verse 8, in the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly, ungodly people pollute their own bodies, reject authority and heap abuse on celestial beings. Interesting, the things that we do and the things that we find acceptable even in the church today, de facto relationships and things that would never have occurred 50 years ago, the way that we're finding them acceptable today and I think you know, if you have a look back through the, the, the generations of Christians and you look back through the faithfulness of people and we see the way that culture is turning, the way that things are turning, we've got to be careful we don't pollute our bodies. We've got to be careful that we stick to the Word of God. We've got to be careful that we do exactly what He asked us to do and don't divert, don't change our thinking, don't step aside, don't go to the left or right, go straight down where He's asked us to go. And I only use these because these are so, that is an example that I see as being often being acceptable or how do we function with that? It's not. We reject authority. They reject authority. The false teachers reject authority. They, they rewrite the doctrine. They rewrite the teaching. They, they change the meaning of, of scripture. The, 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 the cultural shift can make people think that it's okay to do one thing and then actually the Bible says all differently. It's, it's the whole thinking about how we present the word, about how we what we say is okay, about what we say is the absolute life-giving matter of the word. And what we do, we need to have lives that are consistent with the word of God. And that slander celestial beings, um, that slander, uh, slander celestial beings is in Acts 7, 
35 and 53. Thirty-eight and fifty-three. Sorry, uh, he was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with their ancestors, and he received living words to pass on to us. And then in verse fifty-three, you have received the law that was given through the angels, and have not obeyed it. That's the suspected of the slandering of the celestial beings. That it's those angels that the law was given to, and and I think that. We go back to the beginning where it was the, the, the people of Israel, the Israelites, had come out of the Exodus and had not seen because they had not believed. They did not see ahead. They did not believe. We come back to that. They have rejected the law of God. They have rejected the one who gives us the word. They have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ and his power. They have rejected that he is God. They have rejected that he died and rose again. The false teachers. And there was not obedience. See, it says, these dreamers, Dreams, the people that claim to have a message of God, luring people away with false revelations. We've got to be very careful what we see in dreams, very careful what we believe to be hearing from God. And the problem is that it can sound all good, and we can go, oh wow, that's really interesting, and it could be all wrong. Let's be careful that it's consistent with the Word of God. They're very tricky. They're, they're not going to, as I said with, in, in Titus, false teachers are not going to rock up on the door and they're not going to have as their welcome badge, hi, I'm a false teacher. They're not going to go up to you and say, oh, my occupation, false teacher. Hi, my gift in the church is false teacher. They're not going to make it that obvious. They come in and creep in and give little things that make it sound like they're good, but they're not. And in, in this, in verse 9 and 10, but even an Archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet these people slander whatever they do not understand, and the very things they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, there's the evil beasts, as the irrational animals do, will destroy them. It will destroy them. Now this last part is, is from, and there's a couple of parts in Jude, one we'll get to in a, in a, later, in a later time, but um, that are not actually biblical parts, but Jude has used this element of truth here that we, that we see. But the, the, the writing in this section is from, uh, actually it's this one. Um, of, of the, from the Assumption of Moses, the book, The Assumption of Moses. But here, we're listening to what Jude is telling us, because this is the word. Extra biblical, don't have the same authority. Jude has the authority. And so Michael, the Archangel Michael, pretty important guy, does really high job for, for God. And, and he's disputing here with the devil. Um, the thing we have here is that Michael could work out that the devil's not, you know, the devil's accusing Moses. Moses, so the devil, yep, he, the body, I want, to, I want to look after the body of Moses. It's a material thing. I want to be able to have a say on that. The devil is also going, hey, but, but God, Moses is a, is a, you know, arguing Michael. Moses is, is, is a murderer. You know, Moses shouldn't be going to heaven. We don't quite know the dispute there, but what we know is that Michael leaves the judgment for God. The Lord rebuke you. Here, one of the things is that there is a, there is a condemnation 
of false teachers. There is a, a sharp rebuke. There is a silencing them. There is a, something to say, yes, you have not got a hold of the truth. Yes, you are misleading people. Yes, you are misrepresenting the truth. But it is not for you to cast the final judgment. That is the Lord's. And we should be like Michael who said, the Lord rebuked you. Whatever you take from today, my problem is I led one way and I've gone another. And I know you shouldn't say that as a preacher and make it obvious, but I want you to know that I'm still human and my mind's going in three different places. But I've come to a point that I think God wants us to know. He loves you. He loves his church. He loves his word. And he loves relationship with us. He's very precious about that. He's very precious to defend his relationship with you. So when he gets really upset about <coughs> false teaching, it's because he's saying, I love you. 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 Everyone here who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves people. Amen. For those who don't yet know you, know him, I love you, I love you, I love you. And I will protect every way that you have to come to me. Do you see? He wants us to value it in that way too. For us to love people and say, we want a clean path to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth and the life. And there will be nothing that I will allow to stand in the way of you contaminating the name of my Lord Jesus Christ. Contaminating the words of my Lord Jesus Christ. There will be no way that you will stand. I will fight to the death. I will stand for the faith. I will stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. I will not take a backward step. There will be no compromise. And if you think I'm harsh, if you think to say silence them, if you think to say sharp rebuke, read the word of God. I value relationship with people and I value my truth being planted in their hearts and I value a life that is consistent with that truth that my people may flourish and the glory of my, my life, the glory of, of my hope, the glory of my promise, the glory of the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ <coughs> will shine through, through, your, through my people. Let's go with God. Let's stand with God. Let's fight for the faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you use broken vessels like us so all over the shop. But um, Lord, you, your truth speaks. Your truth is fresh. Your truth is alive. And you desire a deep relationship with us. And that is what we're on about. We want to love people. We want to love your word. We want to love you. Inspire us this week. Uphold us this week. Protect us this week. Help us to persevere this week. And uh, give you all the praise and glory that's due your name. Amen.